I'm Marty O'Donnell, I'm the uh, audio director of Bungie, and I'm also the composer for Bungie. My musical background, yeah. Uh, my mother was a piano teacher, and my father was a film director, so I grew up sort of always wanting to uh, see if I could put those two things together, and I uh, started taking piano lessons young. And uh, through high school I was playing piano, and then I became a piano major at the conservatory in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, for my college and about two years into it I decided that I would rather be a composer rather than perform at the piano. I enjoyed composing more so I switched to composition and followed up with a master's in composition at USC. First in instrument I learned to play was the piano. Um, then I started taking the flute which was tough for a young boy believe it or not Taking the flute didn't last a real long time, but it was actually good for me because I learned uh, uh, woodwinds, and I re actually really loved the flute. And uh, but I sort of stopped that about first part of high school. It just wasn't very, very. I didn't get girls by playing the flute, unfortunately. The piano wasn't that much better, but it was it was okay. Yeah, I always enjoyed video games from the earliest, and I had two young daughters, and I bought the Nintendo system so they could play it. Um, but unfortunately, I played it more than they did. So, <laughs> uh, along with that, computer games. I had always played computer games. Um, somewhere around ninety, I think it's ninety-three, when uh, Robin and Rand Miller were making the game Mist. I actually got to meet them before the game came out and uh, saw the game Mist. Heard the game Mist, more importantly, and I realized I had been doing audio work from Chicago as a commercial composer and a film composer for for years at that point, and. I played games, but I never thought audio for games was that interesting or high quality enough in terms of production for me to be really interested in switching to it. And when I heard Myst, I realized that things were starting to really get interesting. And uh, through the 90s, I, I kept talking to those guys, and I got to do the sequel to Myst, which was Riven. And that was my first uh, exposure to doing uh, audio for games. Well, that was my first big break, and I was lucky because at the time, in the mid-90s, I think uh, Cyan uh, was on the top of the heap. They had the biggest selling computer game of all time, which was Myst. Um, they were nervous about having anybody who wasn't sort of in their family do something with them, and I happened to know uh, one of the guys there pretty well, and I knew his father, and so I was a little bit on the family side of things. Uh, and they finally started to trust me and let me work with them on that game. Um, so as soon as I started working on Myst, though, I, I found that there was another company actually in Chicago, because Cyan was in Spokane and I'm in Chicago, and there was a company in Chicago called Bungie, and they were doing some pretty cool games that the guys at Cyan actually liked to play. So I thought, well, I'm going to talk to these Bungie guys and see if they can give what I do a listen, and maybe they can give me a break. So uh, almost simultaneously, I did Riven, and I did this other game, don't get confused, <laughs> I did a game called Myth, The Fallen Lords. And uh, so I didn't do Myst, I did Riven, but I did Myth. Okay, so now you got that straight, you're fine. Uh, always enjoyed classical music and classical piano and jazz. Um, and then I, I sort of got into the Beatles a little bit late and uh, the first real fall in love kind of music that I really thought was cool was um, progressive rock. So that shows how old I am. Uh, from the early 70s uh, all the way through, I was really a fan of progressive rock. So um, that turned into fusion. So now we're talking bands like Jethro Tull, Genesis, Gentle Giant, Yes, King Crimson, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. You know all these, you can hum a few of those things, I'm sure. No, nobody can. Anyway, uh, it was very complex music, and I really loved it because it had a lot of classical um, stylings to it. It had some classical feelings of counterpoint and, and complex harmonies and rhythms, which I always enjoyed because I was a big fan of Stravinsky and Brahms and Beethoven, and I, I wanted something that had meat to it. I, I've been doing commercial music and film scores and games for so long, I, I just rarely think about what I like to just sit down and play. I think I would like to, to uh, 
get some Debussy and Brahms back out and, and just uh, get my chops back up on that. That's what I think I would do. I think the biggest influences are the prog rock guys and some of the big orchestral uh, composers, although some of the piano composers. Uh, Brahms is a great orchestral composer, but I, I love his piano music. And uh, Debussy also, the piano pieces of Debussy uh, have been influenced by Ravel, uh, Stravinsky, so, uh, and Samuel Barber and Refon Williams, who is an amazing string composer. So all those guys go into the pot. I'm working on Halo Reach, and of course I'm working on whatever it else is that Bungie's working on. So I don't think we've actually been too secretive about the fact that we have more things that we're working on than, than the Halo games currently. There's something else out there, and I'm very excited about it, by the way. I'd have to say, although they're, all the Halos are like my children, and the most current one, which is ODST, I'm very excited about because I got to really uh, do some new themes. But as I look back on all of them, I think I like the first one the best. And I think it's because it was not popular. It was unanticipated. No one thought that, you know, this little company called Bungie was, you know, really had it in them to do something as successful. And we really believed in it. And we were the only ones at the time that believed in it. And, um, there was something really fun about that first foray into uh, this big space opera called Halo, and all those themes came up uh, from the beginning. And I and I worked with them for you know almost nine years. So I think I have the most fond memories of Halo One. I think in terms of the production, uh, I really enjoyed producing music for Halo Three because we were able to even uh, rearrange and bring back some of the classic themes and get a. 60-piece orchestra to, do, to finally do them the right way is the way I like to look at it. So I like them all. I like to talk to the designers. I like to talk to the story guys. I'm there at the beginning when we're thinking of the most basic, you know, what is this game all about? And I, I'm always asking about the characters and the feeling and, you know, what are the feelings that people are going to be going through when they play the game? And if I can sort of label some of those big feelings with music and get some themes going early, then it's something that's malleable that I can, you know, adapt to whatever actually comes out of the game towards the middle and the end of production. Um, so it's, it's really, it's one of the most painful things actually composing with a blank piece of music paper up in front of you, for me. I mean, I'm sure maybe there are composers who love starting from scratch. Um, but I need to have some sort of motivation like story or character or feeling or even sometimes images like the, I think for ODST, the image of just this destroyed, dark, rainy city and thinking about one guy all alone trying to discover the mystery. That was very evocative to me and I sat at the piano and, and just sort of started improvising and I came up with some stuff I liked, sketched it out. Uh, once I get a few things kind of sketched out, I start to expand it think about who's going to play what and uh, see what happens with those themes. Yes, composer's block, uh, all the time. And uh, it's, it's not easy for me to write music. It's, it's easier for me to, to continue writing music that I've already written. I don't know if that makes sense, but if I already have a theme or I got stuff, I can make different versions of it or I can play with those themes. But, um, it's always a bit of a pain to have that blank piece of paper or someone comes to you and says, okay, we need something completely different and it's got to be the greatest thing for the next decade. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, not too much pressure. Thanks for that. Um, and of course, I, that doesn't help me at all. I always think, well, look, just tell me what the next project, what is the next thing you need this for? Oh, a little video we're putting out on Friday? Fine, let me write something for that. And then in hindsight, I can take some of the music that I've written for something maybe smaller, and I can say, hey, there's something good in there. I'm going to develop that bigger. Um, but it's, I don't know if there's anything you really can do if you're um, um, blocked, other than go outside and run around, or go play some games with your friends, or 
go to the amusement park with your daughter, whatever it is. You, you, you sometimes you just have to distract yourself and then go back and lock the door and keep plugging away. What we did with Halo uh, ODST was we decided right from the get-go that we're going to tell a new story, have a new feel, and uh, Joe Staten pretty much came to me and said, I think we've landed on a, a different feel, which is a film noir feel. And so I'm like, oh, film noir, that's black and white, that's Venetian blinds, that's smoke, that's guys with hats that, you know, you hear their footsteps on a rainy street. And that's really what we wanted to, to evoke that kind of feeling. And if you, if you make that into a more of a uh, sci-fi universe, because it's still sci-fi, uh, it's more like Blade Runner. So it wasn't like the music to Blade Runner was an inspiration, but the feel of Blade Runner was an inspiration. Um, so I guess that's what it is. Film noir, I liked, you know, it's like something has to be evocative and intimate, like a, a saxophone. And so some piano, some sax. Uh, and that's not all that plays. I still have the big bombastic uh, orchestral stuff. But I, I thought, well, I'm going to move away from the choir of monks and move right into, you know, Thelonious Monk. Now that one's going to be a lot more tough for me. I, I don't think I can have a single favorite piece of music. Um, I, there are times when, I, when I'm composing a certain piece or working on a piece that I totally love it and then a couple months later I'll listen to it and I'm like, uh, that's horrible. So uh, it's really hard when you're really close to your own music to, to even know what you like. It's because I can love it one day and hate it the next day. So um, some of the stuff that tends to, I return to, um, I think they usually end up being a little more on the contemplative, intimate piano side that I just tend to, you know, I, I like listening to them again. And I, I don't know if it just takes me back to what I was thinking while I was composing or it's really hard to say. So I, I'm not going to give you a single answer on that. So. There was a pretty good challenge for me when we had to do a, a E3 demo, I think it was in 2000. It was for Halo 2, and we were going to do a, about 10 minutes of real-time live gameplay. And the, the engine that played audio and music and so forth wasn't really stable yet. And we didn't really know how it was all going to work, and I, I wanted a big orchestral. We wanted to blow all the people away at E3, and we knew Bill Gates was going to come out and introduce it at the press conference, and it was going to be on a big screen and be in surround. And there was a lot of pressure on that to make that really, really cool. And uh, uh, it was so it was there was a sort of setup beginning, which was scripted camera of the ship flying in, and then Joe took over seamlessly and played the rest of the game on stage, and the music had to make a good transition there. And then when the you know the jackals came out and surprised everybody, the music action had to kick in, and and uh, scoring that whole thing and implementing it to play back every time. Uh, even though there was somebody playing the game live, uh, it was a bit of a, a bit of a struggle, and uh, so that was the Earth City, uh, New Mombasa demo that we did, and that was that was tough. It was good though. I liked it. Well, I used to paint houses, and seriously, I mean, I was I would recommend this to all musicians. Get a trade, because. <laughs> Most likely you're not going to make a living as a musician or a composer. I mean, goodness sakes, I, I make, being making a living as a composer is like a, such a long shot. Uh, so I would say I would probably be doing something in the trades or I might follow to my father's footsteps and done some uh, film directing. And once again, it's still good to have a trade. But um, I always enjoyed being on the set and directing actors, which is another nice thing about being an audio director at Bungie is not only do I get to compose music and work on sound design for all this stuff we're doing, um, but I get to work with the actors. And I, can, I think I can bring something a little different to the actors, not only because I understand how to direct and get the emotions from them, but I then am able to think about, well, what kind of music is going to help support the drama of the scene. So I'm there from the very beginning, and I get to play with it and fix it and mix it the way I like. 
yeah, I don't want to paint houses anymore. So <laughs> I would say the motivation is if, I, if I'm not getting to do this, I could be, you know, an apartment painter in the middle of some college town like I was at one point. So, uh, and the other motivation is I had, you know, two kids and they needed shoes and clothes and they had to go to college and all that stuff. You already heard my first advice for aspiring musicians is learn a trade. Uh, but I would say you're, if, if you have the curse of being a musician, uh, it's also a blessing. Uh, don't think that you're going to necessarily be able to put food on the table because you're a good musician. I would say don't trap yourself into one thing. Don't just say, I am the best oboe player ever and that's all I'm going to do because the world just doesn't care that much about great oboe players. But if you're a great oboe player and you can edit dialogue, and you can come up with great sound design. I mean, everything you add to your repertoire that, that has to do with music or sound uh, technology um, is gonna make you more valuable. And then I would also say, you know, take every opportunity that comes your way and, and gladly throw yourself at it.